Good morning. Good morning. Amazing. You actually look awake. <laughs> I'm happy again to be able to kind of facilitate the panel discussion. Our panels this morning are Jean Charest, Barbara DeGroote, and Helen Mixes. They've been very gracious in um, responding to the challenge that we offered them because they couldn't really prepare much for this. We've asked them to give their response to these days, which means that they had to be attentive and be able to put into words what has been happening within them. And so the sharing that they're going to give with us is a good example for us because we'll be following them. <coughs> so without any further ado, we'll start with Jean. I don't know if it's good to be the first or the last in this. <laughs> um, when Emma had called me, I said yes, and I went, oh my God, what did I get myself into? And then when I got the questions, I said, how am I supposed to prepare for this? Because it goes, what's the impact? I said, I have to be there. So here I am. And I kept changing this, so folks, you're going to have to bear with me because I ran out of paper. <laughs> because every day there was something new, and I said, well, the heck with this, the Spirit's going to have to move me along. Because there were things every day. But I'll start with the middle question, which is, what goes into a vocation? And really, I was drawn to, there's only one thing that goes into a vocation, and that's love. The love of God to us. Our response to God, but I remember Sister Claire's diagram with the cross. And I think for many of us, for me, for I, <laughs> that's something else I'm bringing back. <laughs> but for me, and I think for some of us out here too, uh, it's a me God. And that doesn't work too well, especially in our vocation. It's a me God and a few other people. I'd like to say my Sim family on one side and the rest of the world and what have you on the other side. And in the middle is where I find my mission. And like a flower, you know those flowers that close, almost like the Venus fly trap, it closes in. And this way we can embrace kind of everything, me, God, the rest of the Sim community, and the rest of hopefully my Franciscan family. But that's based on love. That's what holds it together. And the Franciscan vocation calls us to relationships. So again, yes, I have a relationship with God, but that calls me beyond that. And it's an unconditional love. Now, in case some of you don't know, and that'll help you find my picture on the board, um, if you haven't found it yet, I love dogs. There's only one picture there with dogs. I think that makes it simple. <laughs> And I think dogs have been sent into my life as an example of unconditional love. I know that if I'm even gone for an hour, I am greeted as if I had been gone for years. I have Labradors and their tongues say a lot. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I am dearly loved. And when I come back this week and pick them up on Sunday, they won't say, like we say, well, where have you been? <laughs> and I hear some of you with cats who, you know, they kind of, eh, you've been gone. Well, take this. <laughs> Dogs don't do that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't think cats give unconditional, dogs give unconditional love. Oh. And, <laughs> will not have cared that I've been gone for a week. They'll say, good, you're home. Let's go play ball. Let's go for a swim. My distance has been totally forgiven. And I think that's set for me as an example. When I meet you, it's like you've been gone forever. And if it's been a long time, it's like, but that's OK. I haven't heard from you. That's OK. Something was going on in your life at that time. Margie's, uh, Marjorie's reading of the bones this morning. I need a drink as she was describing those bones. I was getting dry with all those dry bones. 
And I felt that many times I've been the dry bones. And that laundry list we made of needs yesterday, those can be dry bones too. If we don't do something about it, if I don't do something about it. <laughs> and then she brought life into those bones. Couldn't you just see them putting, to, they were coming together? I'd like you to talk to some of the orthopedic surgeons I know. <laughs> they would do a much better job. They were just coming glued. And I'm thinking, that's my challenge. That's what I need to do. That's what we need to do. And I will use all three. We, an institute meaning the powers that be, as we like to call them. I, we, the institute. We need to make those bones come alive. Or, we'll, or else they will be nothing but dry bones. What am I taking away? Well, laundry. <laughs> Lots of that. A bill from Jude's <laughs> collection. I'm taking away some very fond memories. I'm taking away faces that I had never met before. <clears throat> People I had never met. You were just names in a circular. There's now a body to that thing. And that's wonderful. I'm bringing away a challenge to look back at my life. Not yours. Not the Institute's. Mine. God didn't call the Institute and say, hey, by the way, give Jean Chires a call. He called me. So that becomes very personal. When Dominic spoke about going off the diving board, I'm not a heights person either. You wouldn't find me dead on the end of a diving board. <laughs> but I remember a, a painting at Rye Beach of fond memories off in the corner that I used to like to sneak in the back there. And it was of a ballerina. Now, you look at this body, you know that's about as far-fetched as it could be. <laughs> A ballerina in my mind. But I always thought it would be nice to be that free, being able to move so graciously. And this ballerina was dancing on the tip of an outstretched hand, on the tip of a finger. And if you really looked at the painting, she was over a great abyss. One slip, and she was a goner. And many times I've been brought to that. I must learn to trust like that ballerina, that that hand, which was the hand of God, would grab her. Bless you. I'm also reminded of something else that's happened. Um, when I had my cancer treatment, I really started reading the works of Bernie Siegel, which some of you may or may have not read. Uh, in one of his books, and I can't remember which one, he says, coincidence. It's God's way of being anonymous. And I think of our day-to-day -day experiences, how God is anonymous to us. And we don't, we don't think about it. We always, oh, wasn't that a coincidence? That was God's way of being there. Can you repeat that one, Co There's no such thing. Coincidence is God's way of being anonymous. And we do make a people in, different, in people's lives. And this is not to boast, but I think we could all look at our own stories. And many times I think we're afraid to share our story because it looks like the only thing we're doing is, oh boy, you did a good job. But we do make a, a difference. And this is the part of the joy and the beauty of coming together that I'm bringing back was having heard your stories. But I think we need that to show us where that ordinary is and where we do make a difference. A number of I work as a pediatric nurse practitioner, and I've been doing that for 22 years. Don't have to be doing that. Very easy to become complacent in there. A lot of my moms are single moms. I was thinking back on how people were saying, you know, the rich memories they have of their moms and stuff like that. You've got to think where our vocations are going to be coming from in the future. A lot of ladies will not have had that experience that we've had of a mom and a dad and things like that. That won't be where there. There'll be some but it won't be. So a lot of, of, I work in a community health center, so I have a lot probably more of a lower income 
clientele than in, uh, let's say, in a private practice. But we had this lady that had moved up from Connecticut to northern New Hampshire. Don't know why you would make a move like that, but she did. <laughs> And one of the first things she told me is that she had had a, there was a child that was in the care or the custody of the state of Connecticut due to neglect, not through, due to abuse, but due to, due to neglect. And she was, the reason she had moved was to try to get away from the influences that were in Connecticut. Glad there's nobody here from Connecticut. They you know, think they're, it's bad. But she was in the inner city and she wanted to get away from that to try to get her life together. She wanted to get her son back. She had another child with her and she subsequently had another child. She was, I think by profession, one of the oldest professions in the book. I think she was a lady of the night. At least my perception of her, how she dressed, was maybe that. Now she had these go-go boots. Now you gotta think, northern New Hampshire, we don't wear go-go boots. <laughs> they don't fit. She had a leather jacket with the long streamers. <laughs> Still doesn't fit. Makeup. I don't think they sold that much makeup in the town, but she had all that hat and big feather. And she used to come in, and there was something charming about this woman. There was a deep love in there that was trying to get out, really. Well, I treated her like everybody else. I assume that everybody should be treated. That's my assumption. So I have clients who's, who have you know, degrees higher than mine and who make a heck of a lot more money than do. But I treat them the same. I have nurses as, as uh, clients, you know, as moms and stuff like that. And I figure when you're the mom, you're not the nurse. You're the mom. And you need all the information I can share with you. Well, anyway, she would come in for the routine stuff and the illnesses and what have you. But every once in a while, she'd have to go to the emergency room because it was off hours or something that went bump in the night that needed care. And whenever she'd have to come back to the fo for follow-up in the office, she would say, geez, I wish I could always come here because of how you treat me. And I thought, no, I don't treat you any different than anybody else. So that went on. And when the changes in Medicaid started happening and women had to go back into the workplace or go back to school, once the kids got a little older, she decided to go back to school. One day she called me and she said, do you mind if I interview you? I said, no. She said, I'd like to interview you for a course I'm taking. I, I think I'd like to go into journalism when I finish this. And I'd like to interview you. I thought, sure, let's help this poor girl. You know, she's trying to get her act together. So she comes and she asked me the, the usual things, you know, where I went to school and did I come from this community and on and on and on. And then she went on to, she knew I had had surgery and what have you and all this stuff and what had made a difference for me. And I wasn't afraid to tell her my faith. I mean, we're so afraid sometimes to say things like that. And I says, my faith helped me. My faith community helped me. My work community did too, very, very much so. And my faith community, and without saying yes, I am, I was able to say I belong to a special group of women. And they were a big support to me through this. And the other day, I need to share this. The other day, I was throwing stuff out. I'm a pack rat. Anybody visits my house, you're going to find that out. I am a pack rat. And I was throwing stuff out, and I come to this box, which holds a very special place in my heart. And I opened it up. And guess what? It was all your cards and your letters of eight years ago. I still have them, folks. And they didn't get thrown away. I read them all. Well, there went my cleaning for the day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she asked those questions and what have you. And then she turned around and she says, you know, you've made a difference in my life. I said, how? She says, you treated me with some respect. You didn't judge me. She says, I'd go to the emergency room. And they kind of rolled their eyes. And, oh, she's back here again. And doesn't she know how to take care of her kid? and stuff like that. Well, a few months after that, I got a call from her. She says, do you mind if we publish it? Mm -hmm. There had been five of us ladies across the northern part of the state that had been chosen by five of these other ladies who somebody had touched their life. So they did. They published a nice little booklet that had that. She had a few of the facts a little off, but that was OK. There was a lot of love that gone into that. And she says, you know, one day I'm going to get my oldest son. I'm going to get him back. Well, she disappeared out of my life. They moved back to Connecticut, and it looked like she was going to make a difference. 
about a month and a half ago, I get a buzz from our receptionist. She says, there's somebody here for you. I wasn't expecting anybody. We usually do not have unannounced. It was my paper day, so we don't have unannounced people. And I said, who is it? She says, I don't know. She says, it's a surprise. She wants it to be a surprise. <laughs> I thought it's a drug rep, right? <laughs> Whoopee, <laughs> what I want today. And I walked out there. And guess who it was? It was that lady. Not in her go-go boots. Not in her fringe jacket. Very well dressed. Very well groomed. With a young man next to her. And that was her son. That she had gotten back. And she said, I had to see you again. I had to show you what had happened. And she handed me a rose. My sisters and brothers, this is the difference we can make. That's the power we have. And we can't hold on to it. This lady will always stay in my mind. <coughs> and if I have touched but one, it was worth it. That rose lasted a long time at home. But it also reminded me of my failures. The times I did not reach out, that I held on to my gifts. Those were the thorns in that rose. So my challenge to you, my sisters, is to leave here and to take up your vocation and touch those lives. The reward is just unbelievable. And I hope you have roses too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and by the way, this. And by the way, this does not hurt. You can squeeze my arm, okay? <laughs> that was a very powerful testament, and uh, we really appreciate your words. Again, Jean has brought up the love relationships, the love relationship with God, and the love relationship with each other. And uh, the fact that we can help each other make a difference in the world by supporting each other. And so hearing stories like this that, that I think gives me courage to go back out there um, to a rather hostile world. And we don't always uh, have the uh, feedback that you got from this woman to know that you've made a difference. And we sometimes have to struggle along, stumble along. <laughs> just hoping that we're making a difference. And when we can now and again get the feedback, it's like a vitamin B12 shot. Yes. <laughs> it gives you that extra boost. Thank you very much, G. Next, we're going to hear from our group, Barb. I too decided to begin with the question of what goes into a vocation because that was something that I could prepare at home. I don't have it. Give it. I too decided to answer the question, what goes into a vocation? And as I began to pull together some ideas, the first thing I did is go to my files for some help. And there I came across a booklet, which we got some time ago on a retreat entitled, Our Vocation. Uh, a rainbow between heaven and earth um, and I love the first paragraph so I will read it to you our vocation originates in the heart of God himself and grows stronger with each passing year at first we may have responded shyly to this divine invitation as it is lived day by day however we grow in grace and the vocation grows stronger and matures as we live it with more love and with ever-increasing dedication, its most secret and most beautiful aspects unfold. These new depths urge us on toward a more intense and even greater generosity. 
and why not? A dynamic vocation is always new. Um, in this paragraph, a vocation is described as a gradual unfolding and a growing and a maturing of a call that originates in God. I see a vocation much like the growing and unfolding of a seed. Probably this comparison comes quite naturally for me because I grew up on a farm and spent many hours in our garden. I still enjoy gardening and help tend the garden that my parish has uh, to help provide food for the local food shelves. A dry, dead-looking seed can seem so insignificant yet it holds such potential within it. To unlock this potential, some things must happen though. First, the soil must be dug up and turned over and made ready for the planting. After the seed is put into the prepared soil, it will remain just a seed until rain and the warmth of the sun help to open its husks and allow the new shoots to burst forth. At this point, the challenge is up to the seed. It must venture forth from the security of its husk. In a similar way, I see the seed of a vocation planted. Just as the soil is prepared for planting of a seed, so must one, one's heart be ready for God's call to a vocation. It takes a supportive and nurturing family life and an open mind and heart to hear and respond to this call. And just as the rain and the sun call forth a seed, God offers in abundance what's needed to allow his goodness to grow within us and to become who we are meant to be. Our part is to be open and receptive and to allow the gifts sown in us by the divine sower to grow and develop. Um, as I went on to think about the various events of these days and the impact that they've had on me, I've been forced to realize how touched I have been in so many ways, but I'm going to name just three. First, I have a very refreshed sense of the importance of remembering and continually returning to our Franciscan roots. Secondly, I have a renewed appreciation of the example of Armida Borelli's life for us. And third, I've been truly inspired by the stories told by uh, sister missionaries. And the final part of our presentation uh, was to name three things that I'll take home when I leave from the chapter of Mats. The first thing that came to my mind, sorry, Father, but I don't think they got all the calories out. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I think I have an expanded waistline. Things feel tighter. <laughs> so I figured that's probably not the kinds of things the committee was looking for. So I <laughs> uh, one of the first thing that I want to name is the new insights and the perspectives which are far too numerous to list. But one example was from Father Jude's homily the other day when he said that God says thank you to me. I often thank God, but I've never thought of the Lord saying thank, thanks to me. So I know that's a thought that I will ponder after I get home. And secondly, from time to time, we get a glimpse of the eternal and it's working through people. But during these days, I feel that I've been gifted with much more than a glimpse, but some very good views through the powerful sharing of the stories and experiences. And lastly, because of the examples I've witnessed this week of people allowing the Holy Spirit to work, I will go home with renewed sense of openness and forgiveness and permit the Spirit to work in me. A rainbow between heaven and earth. What makes up a rainbow? How do we get rainbows? Rainbow. Lights. 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 
Clouds, moisture, stormy weather. And that does kind of sum up our life, doesn't it? That we really have to be out there in the midst of the storm, bringing the light in order for the rainbow to be seen. I, I really appreciated um, the seed, your discussion of the seed, because our vocations do need to be cultivated. We can't just come into this vocation, make our profession, and say thank you very much and go do nothing. It requires constant care, just like a garden does. And so I appreciate very much that. Uh, uh, I didn't grow up on a farm, but my family, my parents did, and I spent a lot of time on my grandparents' farms, and I remember seeing those seeds, little hard nothings, and end up being sturdy plants. So thanks very much, Barb. And again, she points out relationships <coughs> and the importance of the stories that we have shared. I think that uh, that's one of the things I know I'm going to take away. Thank you. Helen. Mm -hmm. Last but not least. Okay. Our first question. Do you hear me, Father? <laughs> Father Cassius? Okay. <laughs> I'll settle that. <laughs> okay. What has been the impact of the days? Up to today, much has been verbalized about how I felt about many things. It was especially interesting to hear Sister's explanation of the evolution which occurred in our own time in the convents, for instance. I remember being deeply moved during our days of recollection at various places to see the empty stalls and dorms of the Trinitarians and the Grey Nuns and so forth. I now understand better the why. What has been the impact of these days? As a family reunion, that's how I looked at it. As a family reunion, I know a Christian can only be refined in community. The days have been a premier community event. I think you ought to applaud now. <laughs> What goes into a vocation? I tried to be very good, very, very good with Emma's letter to make sure that I did everything she said. <laughs> I don't have too much opportunity. I don't have too much opportunity to practice obedience, but I thought, here I can practice. Okay. What goes into a vocation? There is no other reason then a call from God and a response from me. If there is no response, a great opportunity to show your love of God and neighbor can be diminished. In other words, it can be diminished, but by having and responding, you certainly have something more. So, uh, you answer, and only God knows what's in store. Becoming a SIMer, what did it do for me? Certainly, sitting behind Jamali's desk didn't do it. In retrospect, was I crazy to join? I happened upon the veil of the heart at the friary, read it, and was hooked. I liked the veil idea. God and me, private. The simple Franciscan concept seemed acceptable. It seemed to be a good idea to become better. Thee and me, but it didn't go that way. Francis, Claire, and Agnes had a tough time breaking from their families. Francis, Claire, and Agnes had a tough time breaking from their families. You all know the story. They did it once. 
I had a rough time every time I went, and taking off my clothes in Copley, as Francis did, would not have changed a thing because, <laughs> because I had to come home and go again next month. <laughs> I had a tough time going to Easton as a tertiary. Can you imagine wrangling my way to Bethesda for the for formative years, uh, followed, by the, followed by the monthly days of recollections and retreats, uh, using all sorts of psychology and reasons to go? At that time, you know, it was just the time, the post-Vatican days when they talked about synod meetings, this meeting, that meeting, changes. I used that very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't involved in any of it, of any of the synod meetings and stuff like that, but I used it as an excuse. <laughs> Lies, maybe, huh? <laughs> uh, by the grace of God, he sent me a benevolent companion, and it, hel it helped me, it helped to use her as an excuse. Oh, I'm going back to that. <laughs> Anne, Anne, she's a great girl. She lives in Allentown. Francis called me to follow him about 40 years ago, privately, at 31st Street, New York City, to the trail which led me here to Faulkner's today. Wearing a cloak does not make a religious vocation. As a SIMer, do I have a split outlook? By joining SIM, have I overloaded my circuits? <laughs> <laughs> Think about all the print that has been run by me. Did I read it all? If I did, did I sort it out and apply it where applicable? Did I need it? Did it help? If I didn't read it, did I then feel guilty? <laughs> did I need to run off once a month, busy or not, often leaving behind responsibilities? Did I feel guilty if I, if I went and guilty if I didn't? Did I spend my vacation on did I spend my vacation on retreat and have my family and friends say, she's on vacation. She needed it. <laughs> <laughs> did we become stronger in our vocation? Doing, seeing, experiencing things we would otherwise not have done or had? Or did we become stronger, trotting along, pulling two loads, the spiritual and the secular? That is more than the nuns of old did. <laughs> <laughs> what goes into a religious vocation? In the world and not of it. You know what? Do you know what? You know the Heaven's Gate cult have the same slogan. I was stunned when I heard that. Now, Father always says, this, make your life a story, storytelling time. So, I have a story for you. <laughs> You'll never believe it. Guess what? I sneaked out last night when in, and the final SIMer went to sleep. Where did I go? Up to the cliff Father Paul talked about. I wanted to see it. And guess who I met? Who do you think I met? Any, any, any answers here? Who? No, no, no. Guess who I met? So unexpected. It was Holy Father Francis on our premises. The little man stopped me with a firm gesture with the left hand and said, Hello, Helen. I said, when I picked up the word the other day, I said, Salute. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
trying to impress him with an Italian greeting. <laughs> he asked me, he asked me, where is the bonfire? You know, at these mats, they, they had these big bonfires in the past. I just shrugged my shoulder and said, I'm not in charge of anything. <laughs> and we talked. Boy, is he a good listener. <laughs> and he took me exactly where I am. I felt no need to impress him. He asked me questions. I have a list of questions he asked me. I quickly ran back and jotted everything down. <laughs> he asked me questions. Are the townspeople of Faulkner going to bring you food to eat? That's what they did at the Mats of old, you know, the Francis Duncan gang came and the town came a running with the food and or else they wouldn't have eaten. Well, anyhow, he said, are the townspeople of Faulkner going to bring you food to eat? No, father, we have a catering service. <laughs> We have at Loyola down there at the building, Marion Griesheimer, who is celebrating her 40th year as a consecrated secular. <coughs> Father, as for me, I went another route first as a tertiary and then became a missionary of the kingship. He said to me, did you ever visit Assisi? Oh yes, with the help of SIM angels. Did you go elsewhere in Italy? <coughs> yeah, I said, yes, yes. I was to Rome that time, Milan, Florence, Castel Don Golfo. I even visited the Tivoli Fountain. I wish I would have had some emodium along that day. <laughs> must you deal with? I said, management of time. The challenge is to learn to respond immediately to whatever it is time for. <coughs> now that is important and I will repeat it. The challenge is to learn to respond immediately to whatever it is time for. Then uh, I said, how about TV? Huh. I said, you are the patron saint of the media. <laughs> and that is why you ask. Guess what? It is a malicious time consumer. If I but spend two hours per day watching it, I lose 62 hours of valuable time a month. The content is heartbreaking. Peace is not promoted. For the most part, only nice looking people are portrayed. Question, <coughs> do your family and friends know you are consecrated? <coughs> no, not really. I put forth a lot of effort disguising and not discussing it. In fact, a brother once asked me if I joined the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> me, he asked me, are you ashamed of being 
an SI Ammer. Oh, the veil of the heart led me into it. I like that veil idea. Just Jesus and me. Now I am beginning to feel I should let go a little bit. <clears throat> my, brother is, uh, my brother met a secular Benedictine gal on a trip. She was open about it. He was impressed. I sort of think I should permit a meltdown. <laughs> Does an SIM uh, retire from the institute at a certain age, he asked me. <laughs> as far as I know, they have never given it a thought. <laughs> Actually, it is a natural attrition thing. <laughs> What did I say here? <laughs> he said, I said to him, I was a little nervous at that point with all these questions. He said, do you know Heaven's Gate cult were right after uh, the fact that the body is but a container? Did you ever think of that? The Heaven's Gate people said your body is a container. In it dwells the essential where age and the, and the push of time are not important. Actually, a vocation does not age. Now, here's a good question. The only father would think of it, Father Francis. Uh, is your leadership idealistic or realistic? That's a tough one. I'd say they are idealistic. But by darn, the membership better, better be realistic in today's world. <laughs> question. Do you love one another, or are there just superficial exchanges? I would hope we bomb each other's wounds before we go out to save the world. When the missionaries go home, will it again be old hat, or do you think maps will make a difference? These days will affect all who participated in them. It is a time of absolute immersion into godly matters going your route, Holy Father Francis. Father said then, with the close of the meeting, almost the close of the meeting, he said, let us pray together and then you better go back. You've, you've got to get some rest. You're going to be on a panel in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Ask your friends if they ever kissed a leper or even nodded to one. And you, he said to me, you better begin now, for up to now you have done nothing. <laughs> away with me. Blessings galore, new resolutions, <coughs> remembrances, and, and. <laughs> <Anyhow>. <laughs> Each of us to think about. 
and I really appreciate that you had that conversation. It must have been quite a late night. <laughs> and so our panel has concluded, and they have given us um, a lot to think about, especially as we prepare to go into our small groups. And I want to thank each of you. Each of you has been a great storyteller. Didn't know we had such talent. Mm-hmm. <laughs>